Dean with me. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Kennedy School and to the Institute of Politics. We welcome you this evening. My name is David Pryor, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. And, and we have a lot of great events here, and we are always happy to welcome you and to extend to you our best greetings as you come for these uh, great forums that we have here. Let me announce uh, about two forums that are coming up. 
One is Monday night. Senator Orrin Hatch, the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, is going to come and talk about the future of the Supreme Court with the new president, George W. Bush, what the court is going to look like the next several years. Those of you interested in that sort of thing will hear it from the horse's mouth. Senator Orrin Hatch, 6 p.m., right here. You're all welcome. The following night, we also have a pretty fascinating program. Al Sharpton, he will be here in the forum, 6 o'clock. We welcome all of you to come back and to join us to hear Al Sharpton as he gives you his ideas about the current state of affairs. Let me say that tonight's program is one that we hope is going to have people not only talking about government service, but also talking about service in local government. As we know, Tip O'Neill said that all politics is local. Some people say that the best government is local. This is about people who can make a difference in government, local government, the government that is closest to the people. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Associate Dean of the Kennedy School of Government, Joe McCarthy, Dean McCarthy. This is our great local politician, Senator Pryor. Thank you for your hospitality tonight in the forum, Senator. Uh, and uh, let me uh, welcome you to uh, the Kennedy School, uh, to the ARCO Forum, and to tonight's event, which is part of something we're calling City Fair. Uh, this is a, a new effort on the part of the Kennedy School of Government uh, to refocus uh, our interests and the interests of our students uh, on what goes on in cities. As uh, Senator Pryor said, uh, all politics is local and some of the best politics is local. And we have found that among our graduates uh, who report the highest job satisfaction are those who go to work in cities. And uh, so we've, we're now trying to, uh, to interest uh, many of our graduates in cities and to try to interest the cities uh, in the Kennedy School. And this is what we're calling City Fair. We have here uh, tonight, or they're either here or on their way, representatives from seven cities, uh, from seven city governments, from seven mayors, including uh, Baltimore, uh, Mayor O'Malley City, uh, Boston, Chicago, Denver, Minneapolis, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. And uh, at least one of our uh, very uh, satisfied graduates who works for, uh, for Mayor Williams in Washington is here, Mickey Seligman. Is, where's Mickey? There she is, right here. And this is part of an idea that Mickey and I started talking about uh, a year ago. Uh, so tomorrow, the representatives of these cities will meet with 80 of our current Kennedy School students to talk about the possibilities of working in cities and specifically in the cities that I've just listed. It is now my pleasure uh, to move to the introduction of tonight's events and our speakers. Uh, and uh, first, I would like to uh, introduce um, the mayor of Baltimore, uh, Martin O'Malley. Uh, who is uh, not a stranger uh, to the Kennedy School. Uh, we like to call him an alumnus. He uh, was here last year as part of the Institute of Politics New Mayor's Executive Program. And he said this seems like a long time ago. Uh, this is, uh, the, I think, in a time measured in being the uh, chief executive in a city probably is, uh, is different than time measured otherwise. Uh, he won the mayoralty in uh, Baltimore on November 2nd, 1999 with 91% of the vote, and, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he, his objective is to make uh, Baltimore uh, the greatest city in America, the stated objective, and he's off to a fast start. He's been busy cleaning up the city, turning vacant trash-strewn lots into parks, reclaiming street corners from drug dealers, and weeding uh, the deadwood out of city government. He's spearheading a, a new high-tech renaissance and bringing in new employers and creating thousands of high-paying jobs in the city of Baltimore. Uh, why, in fact, he is the uh, mayor who, uh, some say, brought back the NFL championship to the city of Baltimore. Uh, 
I have heard some Marylanders, uh, in fact, refer to him as the Johnny Unitas of politics. So we'll see. We'll see. Uh, uh, some of his specific accomplishments include reducing the crime rate by 12% uh, in his first year uh, as mayor. Uh, he had pledged uh, that he would reduce the murder rate uh, to fewer than 300 uh, in the city of Baltimore. And last year, there were 262 homicides, uh, a reduction of 43. Uh, the city reclaimed 10 open-air drug markets by coordinating efforts between police and other city departments. Uh, Mayor O'Malley has increased funding for recreation and parks for the first time in five years. Uh, so now there is a place for the wannabe ravens to practice. O'Malley, uh, Mayor O'Malley believes that the government uh, should be more entrepreneurial, something we believe in here at the Kennedy School, far more pragmatic, and far less tied to the old definition of what is good and what is bad policy. Uh, his state, he states that, and I quote, good policy is that which works to, to accomplish an end. Uh, in addition, uh, and this is uh, to show that he has the courage of his conviction, uh, it's, uh, my notes say that he revoked 700 special parking permits from city employees <laughs> and, and, can, and lived to tell the tale, and uh, halted take-home car privileges for 100 city workers and sold 170 city vehicles, uh, a quite courageous act by any mayor. Uh, the, uh, uh, I might also uh, mention that uh, I'm particularly proud of this mayor because uh, uh, he, like I, and like his uh, first deputy mayor, Michael Enright, are graduates of what we consider the best Jesuit high school in the country, uh, Gonzaga High School in Washington, uh, D.C. So uh, I will introduce the mayor in a moment uh, to uh, say a few words about uh, Comstat and, and the uh, uh, the application of CompStat in the city of uh, Baltimore, which is referred to as CityStat. Uh, this is a management system, uh, particularly for fighting crime by using analytic methods that was developed by the other panelists here this evening, uh, Mr. Jack Maple, who um, was a member, was deputy police commissioner for operations for the New York uh, Police Department, where he developed uh, CompStat. Uh, and is widely recognized as the uh, nation's leading uh, crime control strategist. Uh, he left the New York uh, Police uh, Department after 28 years in uh, 1996, uh, and uh, he is now a consultant uh, to cities, including Baltimore, uh, on uh, Comstat. And uh, we will uh, ask him uh, also to explain uh, Comstat and how it applies in the city of Baltimore. Mr. Mr. Maple. Good evening, everybody. I will try to be brief and coherent. I uh, just want to let you know I've never accomplished both things at once. <clears throat> I think we should turn the clock back to 1994, New York City, on the edge of out of control. Uh, Rudy Giuliani is elected. Bill Bratton was made police commissioner. And we almost lost the city the four years before that. In 1993, there were 1,946 murders in New York City. There were almost 6,000 people shot, 86,000 robberies, 99,000 burglaries, 120,000 car thefts. We had a police department that was demoralized, that they thought they were the best in the world, but they weren't quite as good as they thought they were, but they didn't know really know how magnificent they could be if they really applied themselves. And nobody believed that when we walked through the door there and we said, you know, we're going to cut murder in half in this city. We're going to knock down the crime and we're going to do it right. The newspapers laughed at us. Even there were many chuckles within the police department. Because the year before, they had a 2% drop in murder and a 4% drop in crime overall. And just to give you some size of, of New York City, at that time there were three police departments there, the New York City Police Department, the Transit Police, and the Housing Police. And the three of them together added up to about 38,000 cops. And like most large organizations, the detectives didn't speak to patrol, patrol didn't speak to narcotics, nobody spoke to the precinct commanders, and 
we had to get a way to wrap our hands around this monster. So Bill Bratton, myself, John Miller, John Timoney, who was the first deputy commissioner, spent long nights planning what we were going to do. How could we get a hold of this monster and get something done? So we were sitting in a joint one night called the Lanes. I was having a couple of champagnes. And you know, after you have a couple, you can really focus <laughs> on one thing. You can't focus on anything else. And I started writing things down on a napkin. And I said, what is, really, what is this really all about? What do we have to get a hold of in city government? And the first thing I wrote down was accurate, timely intelligence, which is clearly communicated to all. Because as you well know, when you study any organization, the toughest thing to get is accurate intelligence. You go to one department, they give you one set of numbers. You go to the detectives, they give you another set of numbers. You go to patrol, and you have a mess. And I said, all right, after we get this, what would be the next thing we'll be able to do? Well, after you get the correct numbers, then you want to be able to have a rapid deployment to where those crimes are. The third thing would be effective tactics and strategies. And the last, and probably the most important, is that you want to be able to hold people accountable. So you want relentless follow-up, all right, and accountability. So that's all great to say. It's great to say sitting around some table, but how do you get it done? Well, in 1994, the Starship computer that we had on the NYPD was a 386. And we wanted the crime. We only used to gather the crime every six months there. And people would hang around, and they'd hold hands, hoping, you know, this crime going up or down. Nobody looked at it every day, and that's what you have to be able to do, and that's no matter what organization you run, whether you're involved in the stock market, whether you're involved in sales, you're involved in government. You got to know where you're at. So what we started to do very quickly is we had the 76 precinct commanders tally up the crime numbers every week, put 76 radio cars driving them down to headquarters, and then we added everything up into this 386. And we started to bring borough commanders in and question them about crime. Now, a borough commander is in charge of about 10 precincts. So they would come down, and then we finally found out that the NYPD commanders were never asked follow-up questions before. They're, they're, when they were asked the question, why is crime up in Chinatown? Oh, there's a lot of heroin down there. Nobody was ever asked, well, where is it coming from? Who's selling it? Who has it? How do you know it's heroin? How do you know that that's the reason why robberies are being committed? So they weren't really prepared for that. So we looked at that team of chiefs that they had there, and quite frankly, we cleared the decks. They were not prepared to fight crime. We had a mayor who had the political will. We had a police commissioner who had the operational know-how. But we didn't have true believers in those upper ranks. So Bill Bratton made a couple of brilliant moves. He took John Timoney, who was a one-star chief, made him chief of the department to a four-star chief. And we made a few other strategic promotions. And we started to energize the department. And we started to get believers that we were going to knock down the crime. Again, that's all well, good, and said. But how are we going to do it? What we did by hand every week was bring down the precinct commanders, the 76 precinct commanders, 10 at a time. And we put the maps up. And at first, we did the maps with crayons, literally. And then we graduated to those stick-on things. And then we thought we were the cat's pajamas when we had acetate overlays, all right? But we started to quiz the precinct commanders. And we found out very quickly the precinct commanders never spoke to the detectives, who never spoke to the narcotics officers, who never spoke to those officers on patrol. And we let them know that if they didn't speak to one another, they were gone. That this was a life or death situation for New York City. Children were dying in the streets. They had to sleep in bathtubs at night in bad neighborhoods so they didn't get shot in their houses. And we were not going to tolerate commanders that didn't know what the hell was going on in their own commands. So we evolved from that, and eventually we got electronic mapping. We made the commanders speak to one another. The crime started to go down dramatically. 
the cops started to believe in themselves, and quite frankly, the rest is history. In the first, in 1994 and 95, the New York City Police Department reduced crime more than for the rest of the 20th century. In fact, in 1995, New York City accounted for 65% of the crime drop in America. And they only had 3.3% of the crime. But we had to hold people accountable. And I know, and hopefully during the uh, question and answer period, this will come up about how harsh Comstat is or not harsh or so on and so forth. In 1996, and this happens with well, almost every mayor and their police commissioner, the police commissioner becomes more popular than the mayor. Bill Bratton wound up on the cover of Time magazine, and I told him, don't blink. We're going to be out of here quick. <laughs> and I was right. Um, and we were gone, but they've carried on Comstat there in New York, and crime continues to go down. In fact, the murder rate in New York City now from that 1946 to end up this year probably with about 650 murders. Their crime drop in New York is about triple the crime drop in America, um, and the, um, especially in the category of murder. Now, a lot of people said, well, it worked in New York. You had all those cops. Will it work anywhere else? Well, when I left the job with Bratton, in 96, I went down to New Orleans. That was arguably the worst police department in America at the time. They had two cops on death row. Um, I got down there that first day. I remember the chief gave me his gun. He made me a cop, and he said, that's not because there's a lot of criminals here. It's for the cops, you know, like inside the department that may try and get you. I said, oh, great. This is going to be great. <laughs> But the one thing that New Orleans had was, for whatever reason, they had great middle management folks there. They only had 1,278 cops for a city of 500,000 people. We took everybody and we put them in the field under those precinct commanders. We held them accountable. And for 1997, 98, 99, the New Orleans Police Department had the largest drop in violent crime in America. And it was done through their hard work, and it was done because they were held accountable. Um, I guess a, a couple of years later, I met Mayor O'Malley, uh, the 91% wonder man, right? And um, I had written a book at the time, or an article in, in, in some magazine. And we started talking about um, Baltimore and doing the same thing in Baltimore, which had a very high crime rate. And then we got into other discussions and we played what if. What if we did this also with the sanitation department? What if we did it with the fire department? What if we did it with housing? What if we did it with the health department? What would happen? What would we accomplish? Instead of plotting where the robberies were, let's plot where the broken park benches are. Let's plot where the potholes are. How do we know that we're giving everybody the right amount of city service? Because you've got to understand something about Comstat, no matter what's said about it. Those dots don't know if Leonardo DiCaprio got robbed on Fifth Avenue or it was a cleaning lady from Bedford-Stuyvesant. The dot is the same size. There's no special treatment. And where you have a lot of dots, that's where you put your city service whether it's the cops, the sanitation department, the health department, or any other organization. The, the map keeps you honest in that you can't play favorites and that you can deploy your resources the way they should be to address those problems. I'd like to, because I want to leave some time up, a lot of time up for the q and I'd like to introduce the uh, mayor of the city of Baltimore now that can tell you about CityStat and how we took what was learned from police departments across America and started to apply them to the other organizations and the other departments within the city. And I think you'll be impressed with some of the dramatic results that the mayor has been able to accomplish. Thank you. I want to thank you all very much for inviting me 
back here. It seems like five years ago I was here. I was here just a year ago, and somebody said, did you learn anything at the new mayor's school? I said, I absolutely did. Looked around that room at all those terrified faces of other human beings who had this big job, and I learned that misery loves company. And that's, that's what I love. But um, this job has not been miserable by any means. It's been a, a really ch challenging experience. I can tell you that I am never, ever bored. And for those of you that may be sitting out there and saying, well, I wouldn't go into local government, but I'm coming here to listen to these, these folks tonight. Um, you may want to think again. I thought maybe I would run for, for, for state senate and try to go to Congress or something like that. And, uh, and luck and, and other circumstances had no other ideas. And, but I find myself in a, in a great job, in a great city, and that's really on the move again today. And I want to thank you for inviting me up here to talk to you about, about Baltimore through CityStat, which is really changing the way that city governments do business. Um, as Governing Magazine described our efforts this month, we are tracking performance on a scale never seen before in local government. And we have a little slideshow presentation for you here. Where we uh, don't have stick men or cartoons, we're saving those for the folks at Yale. Uh, but we do have a little PowerPoint presentation for you. And uh, there's a man behind the curtain doing this. Pay no attention to him. Uh, let me issue a couple of disclaimers first. I'm very, very proud of what, the, of what Baltimore City has been able to accomplish in this last year. We've uh, reduced violent crime dramatically, murders by 14 percent. We've improved a lot of other things as well. And um, none of those things happen primarily. I mean, leadership's a part of it, but it happens primarily from, from the people of our city who really decided to break out of the, a, a culture of failure that ha had the city in its grips for many years. And it's also due in no small part to the courageous work of a lot of neighbors in some of our hardest hit neighborhoods and the courageous work of a lot of our police officers, uh, five of whom we buried this last year, who are working very, very hard to uh, turn our city around and they're winning. And I also want to issue one other disclaimer. I'll, 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 by way of a thank you, I want to thank Jack Maple. Uh, for coming up here. I want to thank the Kennedy School for bringing him up here. He's not only my spiritual advisor, he's also the creator of ComStat. And as Ed Rendell and his folks used to say, we are kleptocrats. We steal every good idea we can find from wherever we can find it, and we put it to work. And Jack has been a very big part of our success. He was there early and uh, on the ground. I've had occasion to work with congressmen and senators and, and presidential candidates. Um, but the most impressive person I've met in public service is a transit lieutenant from the New York subway who has saved thousands and thousands of lives. Well, here's the presentation, folks. Uh, what, what we kind of figured out was that there's no reason the lessons that we were learning from ComStat can't be applied to managing state government, local government, and federal government, too, or really any large unmanaged organization. And you all would know better than I do whether or not Harvard falls into that category. <laughs> but given the, given the off-the-shelf technology that's readily available and the vast experience that we have now to draw from, from the private sector and public sector, a government can and should be better managed. Boston Scientific Corporation <clears throat> down the road has 13,000 employees and uh, $2.6 billion in revenues. Payless Shoes has 26,000 employees and $2 billion in revenues. And Amazon.com, at least for today, has 9,000 employees and $2.7 billion in sales. Now, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that all of these organizations know how many vehicles they have in their fleet, how many buildings they own. They all have precise measures of how productive their workforce is. And they all have strictly enforced company policies regarding attendance and sick leave. In short, managers in all those companies have a good handle on their assets and they have a good handle on their personnel. And they're able to make short and long-term strategic and tactical decisions based on accurate information. And in turn, guess what happens? The employees develop an understanding very quickly about what's expected from them. When I received my office key a little over a year ago <clears throat> uh, to assume management of a 16,000-person, $2 billion organization, Baltimore City government, we had none of this information, none of it. 
The, uh, but today, because of CityStat, we're moving closer every day to providing much more effective service. And uh, long-time managers are finding out things about their agencies they never, ever knew before, even after decades of supposedly managing them, uh, managing them by feel uh, rather than by managing them by the facts. And before I go any further, let me, let me say one thing that, that, you know, I know that government isn't business. Government is not the same as business. It's not. And if profit were our, bo our bottom line, you know, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't feed the hungry, we wouldn't shelter the homeless, we wouldn't clothe the naked, we wouldn't spend money providing safe environments for children and for, for senior citizens. But I do believe that it's reasonable to, to uh, or that it's unreasonable to expect anyone really to effectively manage anything, any large organization, without having the information necessary to make informed decisions. And folks, that's, that's what all this is about. Last year, we set out to improve services to residents, to make changes being demanded by Baltimore citizens, and we faced a number of daunting problems. I'm going to fast forward through these. First, Baltimore was a violent city. More than 300 people a year, every year, uh, had been murdered in Baltimore City for a decade in a city not much larger than Boston, which had about 35 murders annually. Uh, and understandably, the public wanted change, and they want to change now. Secondly, Baltimore was dirty. We had a lot of trash. We had a lot of dirty alleys, streets, lots, uh, created by a combination of public apathy, by, uh, by uh, unresponsiveness from government, and a lot of illegal dumping. And it was overwhelming otherwise stable neighborhoods. And understandably, people wanted that changed. Uh, thirdly, Baltimore was shrinking. Baltimore was shrinking. Like a lot of other older cities, uh, East Coast cities, we've lost jobs and therefore we lost population. And uh, with violent crime up as high as it was, needless to say, we drove out a lot of population that was left. It left tens of thousands of vacant houses, tens of thousands of vacant houses, uh, boarded up, demolished, uh, rehabbed, all those challenges in front of us. And once again, the public wanted all of that changed too, and they wanted it changed tomorrow. As we work to turn things around, we found that very little in city government seemed to be measured in, in any sort of consistent way, in any sort of real-time manner. Information was collected faithfully, although not always the right information, but it was rarely ever used to manage or make decisions. And if the information was ever used to make policy changes, those changes came about as a result of our one annual budget reviews. As, the, as this camel passed through the eye of the needle known as the City Council's three-week budget process. Uh, implementation took months that way, or, or years, or it didn't have, more likely it never happened at all. By the time a, co a contemplated change was in place, the conditions that prompted the shift might no longer have been relevant. And citizens expected more. And the people I was able to recruit into government were able to uh, also expected more. And you know what? Jesuits taught me one thing, Mr. McCarthy. They, they taught me that expectations become behavior. We've expected more. We've demanded more. And um, there were a lot of longtime employees who knew we could do better, too, with better leadership and better decision making. But for the first few months in office, on many fronts, progress was glacial. Maybe that's why it seems like I was here five years ago. <laughs> progress seemed glacial. Communication up and down the chain of command very rarely happened. Communication between one department head and another department head, just like Jack was talking about the heads of the various bureaus in the police department. Human nature is the same whether it's police or city government. Department heads rarely ever spoke with each other. That was almost non-existent that they talk about operational things. And at the same time, we, thanks to Jack's groundwork and the great work of a man who I think is America's best police commissioner, Ed Norris, we were watching our police department get better and better every day very, very, very quickly by implementing the CompStat process. Instead of checking performance every few months or once a year at budget time, our police department, aided by the 911 on the front end and CompStat on the back end, was seeing improvements start to happen after my initial change in leadership there, uh, started to see improvements happening very, very quickly. Uh, Crime-finding strategies and resource deployments were, were adjusted constantly. Follow-up was relentless, never slipped more than a week. And we were seeing the results that we wanted for our city. You know, during the second half of last year, Baltimore City led the major cities of America in the rate of reduction of homicides. Uh, you heard earlier, we had 43 fewer people lost their lives 
last year than the year before. This year, as I speak today, even this early in the year, we are 20% below last year's lower number on a year-to-date basis. Uh, city stats a critical component of our vision for Baltimore. We've, Jack mentioned to you, we started playing the game. What if we did this with this department and that department? Our very first field trip with my senior staff was to go to New York to look at ComStat. And on, tr on our trip back, I said to all the deputy mayors and our finance director that, um, I said, this is how I want us to manage the rest of city government. And Jack helped us big time. Uh, we are, uh, city stat is uh, part of our way of saying that, you know, government shouldn't try to be all things to all people and do everything. But we should be able to do a certain limited number of things very well, like fighting crime and grime, like providing safe, nurturing, uh, places for our kids, better recreational and school opportunities, and finally creating an environment that actually welcomes and attracts private investment. Our vision is one with, in which an effective, efficient government helps improve the quality of life in every single neighborhood. And um, to realize this vision, we're investing in a breakout strategy that's going to make it happen. Again, premise on improving public safety. But city stats central to making these investments produce results. You know, you don't lose 100,000 people over a decade and uh, not have budget problems. So in a way, city stat uh, was something that helps us improve as quickly as we can, because guess what? We've got no time to spare. We've got very limited dollars. We've got a big ship to turn around. In order to change outcomes produced by government, you have to change how government operates and what government does. And that's what city stat's been doing, not yearly, not quarterly, but every day. I want to go through a few of these slides. And, as I wrap up here and illustrate for you how CityStat works by uh, uh, this first one, and I'll go through the same precepts and principles that Jack had developed for ComStat. First one Jack mentioned was uh, accurate and timely intelligence. Every two weeks in, now in the city of Baltimore, the nine agencies and organizational units participating in CityStat submit detailed information about indicators that determine performance and service. And these numbers include things like complaints, overtime, unscheduled leave, and performance markers like the retention rates for recovering addicts who are in treatment slots that we fund, uh, or the number of children participating in programs at the recreation centers that we fund. This slide's the first page of Water and Wastewater's report. That picture is of Amar Soki, head of the Bureau of Water and Wastewater, and it lists some of the numbers by which Amar and his supervisors are measured. Again, every week and internally in their own department every day. Uh, this next one is, a, is an example, folks, of a graph moving in the right direction. We decided not to bring you graphs moving in the wrong direction. <laughs> this is a graph moving in the right direction. Using timely and accurate information, we dramatically reduce absenteeism and unwarranted accident leave by simply enforcing existing policies. We didn't have to sit down with labor unions and negotiate. It was all there in the admin manual. We just never enforced it. As a result, an additional 100 employees are showing up at work every day, um, just in this one bureau, just in this one bureau, which lessens the burden placed on the, on the vast majority of our city workers who have had to carry weight for you know, the dead wood for many years without managers really caring. Um, as a result of the additional employees, overtime is down 15%, savings to taxpayers about a half a million dollars, $500,000 in water and wastewater so far, which projects out to $750,000 uh, for the year while providing better, more efficient service. The second tenet that you heard Jack mention, well actually he didn't mention, the second tenet is rapid deployment of resources. And as we examine the efforts in our fire department, we notice that three quarters of our calls were for emergency medical help, while three quarters of our personnel were dedicated to fire suppression and fighting fires. Uh, that's a that's a no-brainer. Uh, and we, I think, recorded uh, we were even ha we were having less fires than we'd ever had in our history, but we still hadn't adjusted where the resources. Uh, went to match the problems. We made a decision to shift resources from fire suppression to ambulance service. It wasn't easy. If there's things people love, it's their local school, it's their local rec center, it's their local firehouse. Uh, but we made the change, and we did it again by just showing people, look, here's the maps, here's the problems, here's the deployment, here's the limited dollars. This is why we're doing what we're doing. And guess what? People are smart. People get it. 
You show them, you explain them, they're going to hang with you, even through tough political decisions. Um, we still uh, needed to maximize performance though, through, through more rapid deployment, and we work on that every day. Uh, by pin mapping calls for assistance, we targeted new emergency medical units into those areas that had the greatest needs. And um, compared to numbers compiled prior to CityStat, we've shaved more than a minute off of ambulance response time. Again, that was an example of, of information they always kept track of, but we rarely used to make our decisions. And that, that increased response time, more rapid response time, is saving lives, saving lives each and every day in terms of uh, arriving at the scene as well as getting people to hospital sooner. The third tenet is effective tactics and strategies. And this is something that develops every day in the dynamic. I wish I could show you the, the dynamic that goes on. Uh, the, the slides don't do it justice. But um, as I mentioned earlier, Baltimore is plagued by a lot of vacant houses. A lot of vacant houses, or as we prefer now to call them, we are blessed with a tremendous number of redevelopment opportunities. <laughs> and uh, through CityStat, we are developing the first ever complete inventory of Baltimore's housing stock. Believe it or not, we never had it before. I mean, we had it if you could go look for it. We didn't have it at the click of a button. We didn't know where the uh, outstanding violations were. We didn't know where the vacant houses were. We didn't know where the houses were even that we owned, unless we had to churn them through our tax sale, which never worked, and just put them back out there. Um, so um, we've, been able to, uh, we've been able to finally put together a system that maps those things. We're also, uh, as well as uh, which neighborhoods are almost entirely abandoned, so that we can strategically target the scarce demolition dollars we have, bundle them together, and begin to assemble actual whole cleared lots instead of punching out the teeth of the, of the smile so that we can attract developers and private investment or nonprofits to come in and, and create new and more vibrant uh, assets and neighborhoods. The level of information that we're able to catalog, owner, most recent sales, uh, price, tax status, outstanding housing code violations, vacant or occupied, almost anything you like, enables us to really tailor the strategies much more quickly than we had in the past to take advantage of neighborhood strengths or address the weakness in the neighborhood. Final tenet. Fourth tenet is the relentless follow-up and assessment. And I tell you folks, you can bring in Mr. Maple, you can bring in the $20,000 off-the-shelf software, which we went out on a limb to buy. Uh, you can create a room, but if you don't have people that are really committed to doing this every week, religiously, trying to improve performance, it's not going to happen. It's like building a car and not putting a driver in it. You really have to drive this, and that's what the fourth tenet is, the relentless follow-up and assessment. Trash is something that drives residents crazy. I have yet to meet the person, black, white, blue, green, rich, or poor, who ever wanted to live someplace that was dirty and dangerous. So right up there with crime, we, we attack uh, crime. It drives mayors crazy as well, you'll be glad to know. I have a little green book here. I used to be able, when it was sh all Schmoke's fault, I used to be able to drive across town without having to whip this out and write down there, 1,000 block North Mountain Street. But we are attacking crime <clears throat> each and every day. We're determined that city government is not going to contribute to the problem. So one of the things we started tracking was the missed trash collection, you know, just putting out the mixed refuse. Uh, we hold sur supervisors accountable now by geographic districts, just like the police department does their district majors. And we use city stat meetings to share successful ta tactics and reward top performers. Uh, with monetary bonuses and, and little things like tickets to sporting events. And the follow-up's relentless. It happens every week. We're insistent on improving service to the public. One of our maxims is, is that no department, no department is uh, operating as well as it could be. And on any, but on any given fall Sunday, the uh, city skybox at the Ravens games are now more likely to be filled with uh, solid waste supervisors and uh, and or fleet mechanics than it is with with business executives and i think the results are starting to speak for themselves people are seeing it in baltimore and that sort of accomplishment of small things done well uh, it really gives people courage to to try tougher things complaints are down by more than half since august last year uh, we collected this is a glamorous part folks for those of you that didn't want to go into local government last year we collected 65 percent more garbage <laughs> than we did in 1999. 74,000 tons, for those of you counting along at home, <laughs> compared to 45,000 tons the year before. And that, too, is a measurable outcome. 
And we are just now adding another critical component that's going to improve our ability to implement all four of these city stat, comstat, excuse me, Jack, comstat tenants and city stat. We are currently phasing in a one-call customer service line. One of the reasons the police department under Commissioner Norris's leadership was able to take off so quickly was they had the number coming in at the front end called 911. We're impl implementing a customer service line that should be on later on uh, in the year, which will give residents the same level of, uh, of ease in dealing with city government that they currently have in checking up on whether or not they send in their mortgage payment or whether or not their phone bill's up to date or, or their gas and electric, and that's going to be critically important to us. The way it used to work, the way sometimes it still works, I have to confess, is that if you wanted to get a pothole filled in the city of Baltimore, you would probably make seven calls. You'd call the mayor's office, you'd call the council president, You'd call your three council people in your district. You'd call your Uncle Buck that used to work at water and wastewater and has a friend named Bob that works at transportation. <laughs> You'd call your sister Jane because she used to date a guy that knew a guy that worked at transportation. And then you hope somehow that one of those seven, tri uh, one of those seven uh, calls would make it all the way to the problem. So instead of making six or seven calls, uh, we are going to be implementing a one a, a customer service line so that people get a tracking number. And if it's not done, they're able to call back in and give you the tracking number and figure out why it's not done. Or they're able to call their council person and give them the tracking number. Uh, the one call is going to give us you know, that, that operational proficiency that the police department started with. We already have a system up and running for many common complaints like potholes. Uh, last slide was an actual tracking form. This system has allowed us to make a guarantee, the pothole guarantee. Some accuse me of not having any vision. In response, we gave them the 48-hour pothole guarantee. <laughs> and uh, we are actually meeting it. You know, when you challenge people to do better, they rise to the occasion. Because guess what? The public wasn't the only ones that heard the 48-hour pothole guarantee. The people that take pride in their work and wake up early every morning to catch the bus and go out and do that job also take pride in what they're doing. And they're very proud of the fact, as I am proud of the fact, that we had a 97% success rate over the first few weeks on the 48-hour pothole guarantee. Maybe a little thing, but little things done well allow you to do bigger things. And we're going to be implementing more guarantees so that people can evaluate whether or not their government's being successful. Um, city stats helping us replace a culture of delay, a culture of avoidance, with a culture of accountability and a, and a culture of results, monitored by technology that's really starting to permeate every city agency. It puts information into the hands of many managers rather than just a few people up top who never have time to look at them. And this shared knowledge is really what's democratizing, small d, uh, city government and allowing us to change and adjust much more quickly. And the great thing that Jack alluded to, you know, is that um, the great thing about maps and putting it on a map is a map doesn't know, you know, when you map your problems and put your resources on a map doesn't know whether a neighborhood's black or white or rich or poor, whether a state senator lives there or a judge is on that block. And that makes a tremendous amount of difference. You know, we talk about open and transparent government, and city stats helping us do that. We have a website, www.baltimorecity.gov, and we publish a lot of these city stat reports on that website because we want people to know. We want people to see that we're applying our limited resources to where the problems are. And when people complain, oh, I really liked, you know, I really liked the, the foot officer there every day, we're able to say, we like the foot officer there too. But there were no murders there for the last five years, and we need to put the foot officer where the murders are happening. And when people see it, when they can understand why you're making decisions, it, um, it, it really makes for a, a city that feels itself on the go. City stats raising our expectations inside government, and more importantly, it's raising expectations outside government. Residents are seeing improvements. They can check the reports on the web every week. Technology is making more government more open and transparent. And line managers in the city of Baltimore have far more interaction with top city officials. You know, that's the other side benefit of this. It used to be that we'd make decisions up at the top of the decision-making pyramid, the chain of communication, and they sounded real good up there. But once it gets down to where the rubber hits the road and you actually have to implement it, it can have operational uh, uh, problems and unintended consequences that it may take you a year to correct. We get it done like that. We get it done every week. If it's a personnel problem, head of personnel is there, uh, our labor commissioner is there, our finance director is there, the right deputy mayor. 
Um, and that's City Step, folks. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. It's, this is how we run city government in the city of Baltimore. And judging from the calls we've been getting from around the, the country and the state of Maryland, uh, I, th I think it's going to be the way that local government works. And I was saying to Jack on the way over here, the beauty of what you created, Jack, and, and, and this whole process is it's like, you know, when you look at a paper clip and you think to yourself, man, I wish I had thought of that. That's simple. It really is simple. Human nature's the same. That which is watched gets done. And if you raise expectations, people will improve their performance to meet them. Uh, with $20,000 off the shelf software, a few good, committed people, who believe you really can revolutionize city government. Thanks for hearing me out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I noted uh, that when you mentioned the 48-hour pothole guarantee, all these New Englanders moved to the edge of their seats. This is uh, uh, without any reference to local government. That was uh, just a, a general statement. Uh, we'll now go to, uh, as is our custom, to the question and answer period. If I can invite you to uh, ask your questions by approaching the microphones, one here and uh, one over to my left. Uh, identify yourselves before you ask a question uh, and uh, try to keep it uh, as brief as you can. Uh, before uh, beginning, though, I will mention that uh, the ComStat uh, uh, process and the ComStat approach is something that is well known at the Kennedy School. There is a case on ComStat that we teach here. Many of the faculty uh, teach this case, both in the degree programs and in our executive programs. Uh, a couple of the faculty who teach uh, the case are here with us this evening, and I'm going to ask uh, Professor Steve Kelman, who has taught the case in management courses uh, for some time, uh, to lead with the first question. Steve? Actually, uh, uh, I, I was asked by some students, uh, is Mr. Mabel going to have a bow tie here today? Uh, so I was asked to uh, check it out, and I will... One that I tied, no clip-ons. Okay. All right. I'll, uh, I'll, they, they've... Uh, true. The students have seen the ComStat video where you're one of the stars. Uh, uh, yeah, as, as, as Joe said, I'm, I'm actually happy to see some, some of my students from the uh, uh, introductory MPP management course uh, here today. And, and I actually don't have a question so much as a, as, as a commendation. We do, we, uh, the students in, in the introductory management course, uh, public management course at the Kennedy School, uh, study ComStat specifically, study City Call in Louisville, which I hope you guys are working with and developing your own one-stop uh, customer service line. Uh, Ours is going to be a lot better than okay. Louisville. Uh, <laughs> students, what do they need to pay attention to? Scheduling. Don't have everybody in the same eight-hour shift. Peak we'll talk scheduling. About I'm sorry? Peak scheduling. There you go. See? Okay. Uh, at any rate, and we, uh, you know, we, we all teach a lot about performance management, and I think one of the lessons uh, that, you know, the, that we try to get across is that for this to happen successfully, number one, you don't just measure, you've got to manage to it, and you have to have meetings, you've got to follow up, and so forth, and number two, uh, for this really to work well, you need commitment of the leadership at the top. So rather than asking a question, I think just, I, I guess, I think sometimes my students, or some of my students may suspect that I've sort of scoured from among 7,000 examples of terribly performing government organizations, the th three or four that perform well and sort of teach about them in, in, in our course. I think that, that uh, your, uh, what you're trying to do in Baltimore is, I think, a, uh, a demonstration to uh, a young generation of students considering public service that sort of the spirit of results-based government and caring about performance and, and, and caring about actual, you know, making people's lives better is very much alive and well. So uh, again, rather than asking a question, I just want to uh, express the gratitude of, I think, a lot of us in the Kennedy School community uh, for what you're, you're working on and, and, and the, the results you're, you're working on delivering the, the people of Baltimore. I think it's, I suspect it's an inspiration for a lot of the, uh, the you know, a lot of the students here who are, who are thinking about and considering careers in public service. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Uh, faculty are exempt from the normal rule of making it brief and making it a question. But would he... <laughs> but that was very well said. Thank you, Steve. Would either of you like to comment on uh, before we go to the questions? I'd, I'd... I would only ruin what he said. So. <laughs> 
I'll just say, you know, one of the things you mentioned, a lot of these things seem like little things, folks, but the, um, one, for any of you thinking about going into politics, I mean, it's one of the most gratifying things about this job is you actually can make substantive differences in people's lives, you know, to, to, uh, to do a big cleanup, to go and, and reclaim a neighborhood with coordination of police and housing and DPW to see, you know, see young men playing football in a vacant lot that's been piled up with needles and, and trash and grass is, is not a little thing. That's a big thing to see senior citizens, you know, sitting out on their steps at night in a neighborhood where they, you know, were, were afraid to even open their door because it had been under 24-7 drug do dealer occupation. I mean, th these, are, these are older women whose husbands won the Second World War who uh, raise kids against all odds and on very limited means, and to be able to create an environment for them where they own their home is, is not a small thing. So I'm, I'm talking too long, but thank you. Let me, uh, before we go to, the, to your question, you are next. Let me just uh, simply recognize that we've been joined by our mayor, Mayor Anthony Galluccio of Cambridge. Welcome, Mayor. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your patience. Hi, I'm Jim Robinson from the Kennedy School, a student here. Could either one of you address what challenges you had with uh, the labor unions or what challenges your department managers had and how you worked with those? Do you have problems with your labor union? No, actually, because everything you're doing with it is within the guidelines. Um, you know, even uh, one example is when we first started to do this in New York, those 6,000 shootings that I was talking about there, we looked at the vaunted narcotics division of the NYPD. And I saw that the, the shootings were happening between 7.30 at night and about 4.30 in the morning. When did our narcotics unit work? 11 in the morning to 7.30 at night. And they had weekends off. So when you start to look at things like that, that's when you do get into some, con I mean, it looked like the crooks were making the charts for the cops, actually. But what you have to look at is when is the crime, you look at the contract, and then you fit that in, and if there are problems, you work that out. But what I didn't go into is Comstat is just not the senior executive core grilling those precinct commanders or borough commanders. That's one step. Those borough commanders or precinct commanders should then go back and grill the lieutenants and the sergeants. But most importantly, the sergeants at the roll call whether it's for trash, trash collection or to go out there and fight robbers, should be quizzing the cops at the roll call. And that's really what, what gets this done, that it has to go up and down the entire organization. But you know, you, you do run into a couple of bumps along the way, but you can work them out. We've had pretty good experience in Baltimore thus far with our labor unions. I mean, we have problems for, that come up uh, when we had to close firehouses in order to shift uh, you know, personnel into the medical response. They didn't like it. They picketed. They demonstrated. It was a you know, it was a battle played out in the public. But the, again, that's the key to making sure that it's open and transparent. That you put it on the map. That you say, here, any intelligent citizen of our city, you take a look. You play mayor. What would you do given these resources, these problems? and we've got to deploy according to them. And that's really what's gotten us through whatever bumps we've had. Now, we have problems for other reasons, because we don't have any money, and we haven't been able to offer a really decent raise to anybody but the police department and the firefighters once they sued me. Uh, <laughs> but, but for the most part, labor is not really opposed to this. And in fact, their members appreciate the fact that their hard work is being recognized at the highest level. You know, we do, the, we do some small things that make a difference. When the guys do the pothole guarantee, you know, I send them a thank you note. That we give people tickets to the mayor's box at Camden Yards. That we let people know that we appreciate what they do. And that's what's gotten, uh, that's kind of built the relationship with labor so that they cooperate uh, to a large degree with us. That they're not sitting at the table at the city stat meetings. They certainly know what we watch, what we measure. And we haven't really had to bend any rules or change any rules. We just simply enforce the rules that hadn't been enforced for years and years and years. It's Gail Christopher, the director of our Innovations in Government program. 
Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm very proud to say that Comstat was a winner of the Innovations in American Government program. And one of the purposes of the program is to uh, promote dissemination and replication of great ideas. And this is a wonderful example of when an idea has not only been replicated in terms of reducing crime, but it's actually being applied in a broader sense, a more holistic sense. I've heard the word citizens many times in your presentation, Mayor, and I wondered if you could speak to some specific strategies that you have employed that engage citizens in understanding and responding or, or how are you actually building a constituency when the, so that when the hard decisions have to be made as far as maybe transferring resources mm -hmm. from one system to another and you're going to need votes and support for that. I'd like to know about the citizen engagement component and the flip side of that is the media. Uh, in my experience with performance-based performance management in local government, it's very hard to get the press to tell the good news. And I'm wondering if you have some special strategies that you're using to get the media to to help get your story out there, or have you created your own vehicles for that? Um, I welcome any good ideas you have, since you're the innovations mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. um, we get we get frustrated sometimes because we we sometimes think that the good news doesn't get out. You know, the dry numbers, the performance improvements aren't the sort of flashy stuff that a you know, police-involved shooting or or other things are. We've done a couple of things. I mean, what I try to do all the time is just be out there and be accessible. Never duck, never hide. And one of the things that we've done differently is this whole notion, and, and we drill it in to all of the department heads that, hey, we're the open and transparent government people. You know, it's OK to talk openly and to show people numbers. It's OK to bring numbers to, to uh, community meetings and show people. I, we try to do a mayor's night out every month in one of our districts. We have six different council districts. We try to do a mayor's night out every month, and then we bring in two of the districts every month for a mayor's night in with all the department heads there. The things that we're doing differently, we have a great communications director who's watching live on the web named Steve Carney. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, We've been able to create a, a huge list just using the internet. It doesn't cost us anything because we don't have to put a stamp on it. But we have a neighborhood news flash that we do on a weekly basis. And in the neighborhood news flash, we talk about some of the things we're doing. Uh, this weekend, we have the Super Spring Sweep thing, too. When we all get out and clean up and engage neighbors in big cleanups, we did one last year in the spring and again in the fall. So the neighborhood news flash started with getting the email addresses of everybody that was the community association president. Or, and then it went from there to people start, they get it at the community level, and then they send it to their block captains. And so that thing's really taken on a snowballing effect. And it's really our own sort of publishing mm -hmm. system. And it's short, it's brief, three bullets. Uh, we also do one weekly called Taking Care of Business on Tuesdays that goes out to the business community, who we often have to call upon to help us you know, bridge the gap or rush under a, a rec center or a library or a PAL center to help us out. And so we do a neighborhood news flash. And the city stat templates to those folks who measure their business performance every day, I think it's been very effective in communicating to them in an almost symbolic way. Uh, but it is, it's also real uh, that we're getting our act together that while we're not business, we're being operated more like a business. So I, I, th I think the key is really you got to drill in to all of your department heads that it, you have to be open and transparent in what you're doing. Sometimes the media has hard, had a hard time adjusting to this because they report decisions as having been made when actually they're just discussed. And I don't know how you get around that. You know, you have 26 decision makers in a room and it's very hard to get around that. But to, to be open and transparent, to be out there often, the email things have helped. Yeah, one other thing is what I uh, had them do in New Orleans is, even though the crime had come down dramatically, but we wanted to be honest, open, and transparent, we put all the crime maps on the, on the web every week. And we put it on solved versus unsolved. And then what happens is you'll see there's been a number of murders or robberies or shootings or whatever it is. Here's the solved versus unsolved. And then what happens is folks can make conscious decisions. How should I come home from work? Why should I not have my kids play in a particular park? But they can also look at the numbers and quiz their precinct commanders on why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z, you know? So I think the more that you get out on that, and you put those maps out, and you put the numbers out, but it's got to be timely, at least once a week. And that's the, the toughest part of this game. When we in city government, we make these great pronouncements, big headlines, and three weeks later, nobody's doing it. 
It's like I come from a family of seven kids. My father would come home and say, there's going to be changes around this house. You know, <laughs> you're going to clean your room, you're going to do this and that. That lasted about like a day and a half, and it was over. It's the same thing in city government. So you've got to be relentless when you do this, and you have to police yourselves to do it. But I find doing that, and also offering ride-alongs with as many in the community as possible, with the police, with anybody that wants to go out, they can go out, they can ride around, and they can see what city government does, and do that with the journalists. And just make one agreement with the journalists. Before you print it, just give me a heads up what you're going to print. I'm not telling you not to print it. I'm not telling you it's not a screw up, but give me, just give me the play that this is what I found. I got four of your sanitation workers drunk in a bar over here. Fine, let me know, and we're going to fix it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Do you think we could apply uh, Comstat to raising kids? I got a 13-year-old at home. <laughs> kids, Sir, kids stat. Hi, I'm Paul Carney, a student here at the Kennedy School. And Mr. Mayor, I was just wondering, how sustainable do you think City Stat is, and how institutionalized do you think it'll become going into the future when there are new administrations who may have different priorities, uh, may not be NYPD. You know, as convinced of the success, or may want to try something new? How? easy would it be to change? Well, I, th I, think, I think things become institutionalized based on their success, you know? And, um, and I think we've been very successful with this. You, you were going to say something about the comments? Yeah, I, in other words, uh, uh, Bill Bratt and myself, and that, we left in 1996. Comstat still goes on there twice a week, 0, 0700 in the morning till 10 o'clock, and it's as relentless as ever. And that's the reason why crime continues to go down in New York City. Then, so they can't get out of it if it's successful. Because right. they're deathly afraid if they try and get out of it, and then crime goes up, you're going to say, what did you do that for? Of course, they're changing history the way the Russians did. You know what I mean? Like the statues of Bratton and everybody else being torn down, and <laughs> other people invented things. But Comstat still goes. <laughs> you know, there's a great thing. The day that Bratton said he was going to retire, and I was leaving, and a few others, there was a little, although we had tremendous press, there was a little tiny thing in the daily news about that big, and the headline was, Comstat marches on. That no matter what, he's leaving the new administration, it marches on, and now Giuliani's leaving, and all the mayoral candidates are still talking about that, and they're talking about CityStat and copying it from Baltimore. So. I think the, you know, this has had a big change in Baltimore. It's, it's changed not only the way council people and all of us in government look at what we do, it's also done remarkable things for just sort of rehabbing our image throughout the state as some sort of, you know, bottomless pit. You can put as much money in there as you want, and they're never going to get their schools together. You can put as much money as you want, they're never going to get their crime together because they're a big, poorly managed city. And this has changed that. So I, my real hope is that when I'm gone, that it'll continue to improve and get better. And every month, it's actually getting better. So I think, it's, I think it is becoming institutionalized because of its success. Well, one last thing. I was down when I first went to New Orleans. You know, they're very polite there in New Orleans. Everybody says hello to, mother, uh, hello to one another in the morning, and then they murder each other at night. <laughs> so I get down there, and they, and they said to me, you know, Mr. Maple, when you leave here, we're going to screw this up on purpose, this Comstat. Because they had an attitude down there of like, they like being like some kind of crazy survivor mentality in New Orleans. I said, you're not going to screw this up. They said, oh, no, yes, we are. I said, no, we won't. I said, because that would show two things which you don't have. And that is initiative and the ability to plan. <laughs> so I said, you may recede like the tide, but I assure you that you're not going to screw this up. George. Hi. Uh... My name is George Walner. I'm a student here at the uh, Kennedy School, and I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Maple, for bringing this inspirational story here. Uh, and I have a couple of very quick uh, questions. The first one is, uh, I'm curious uh, how you put together the resources and developed the, the skill for this uh, analysis that goes on. You have to create this analytic, institutional analytic infrastructure now. And so th these skills probably didn't exist to the extent you now uh, have, have put them into government. So that's one question. And the other question is, um, you've talked a lot about, of account uh, about accountability. 
And uh, you mentioned some of these uh, sports tickets as incentives and, and sort of, uh, you know, tokens of appreciation. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, less pleasant side of accountability? How do you hold line and management people uh, truly accountable for lack of performance, uh, which some of us have seen in government and seems to be a bit of a brick wall to overcome? You write them up and then you fire them. And that was something that we never did. You know, we've probably, uh, we've probably written up more people in the last year and a half than had been, than had been disciplined in any way in the prior five, six years. Uh, and we've had, to, we've had to fire a lot of people. We've, we've fired about 100 people, I think, roughly in the last, in the last year, uh, just in, I think, Bureau of Public Works. And, uh, and guess what? When you get rid of people that aren't showing up for work anyway, you don't miss it. <laughs> but you got to, you know? And the other people think, wow. There, there are very few things you can do, absent a race, that improves morale quite as much as noticing that one person among the 10 of you that are out there working hard is really dogging it and making everybody else pick up the slack for him or her. So we, we, that's one thing that we've been doing. You know, the analytical skills, the, the software, a lot of this stuff was already being collected. I mean, so when we put together our city stat team and, um, and this has not been a budget buster by any means, in fact, the mayor's office is, is uh, you know, operating it with a fewer number of dollars than it did before I took over, even with CityStat. But a lot of the analytical skills and a lot of the talented people in IT were already in city government. The, the software was mostly in place. Uh, the, and what we just needed to do was to, to apply those talented people to the task. And then they rose to it. Uh, we, brought, we were able to recruit one young guy out of uh, Philadelphia named Matt Gallagher who had been very active up there and, and measuring performance in uh, Ed Rendell's administration, very young man. But the, most of the people were already people in, involved in city government. Jay Sakai, who runs it and has the technical expertise. And you look at basic things at first, you know, and then it develops. You almost create this sort of intelligence to, to bump it up to the next level. You start off looking at things like the absenteeism and the overtime, and if you hold the managers accountable at city stat, they'll hold their people accountable. Not once a year, but every day, because they know they're coming back in front of you in another week. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Neelam Ari. I'm also a student here at the Kennedy School. And I was wondering, you have been collecting a, no a lot of data, and it's been really interesting to sort of see how your application to the housing market and, and other things. And I was wondering whether you could talk to or um, speak to how this information is being used by social service delivery systems. Mm. And because um, I would imagine that, you know, the schools are affected by these vacant housings and, and so forth. And yeah. to what extent um, the rest of Section government is, you know, benefiting from right. your c collection of this. We've, um, we've done it a lot with health. We have health in. We don't stat social services. And on the way up here, I was talking with Michael Enright, this a red-haired gentleman there who was behind the curtain operating the slides. And we were talking about the need to stat social services. Uh, but we do, do, we do a lot of good things in pub where public health is concerned. Uh, Eric Engberg from CBS was up in Baltimore a couple weeks ago doing a, a report on how, we, how much better we're doing in combating lead paint poisoning which was really capping the potential of a lot of our young kids and substandard rental units. You know, we went for 10 years without issuing, without get, bringing a single landlord to court for lead point paint poisoning. Over the last 15 months, I think we're up to 140 cases that we filed in court. We had three different people, fire, uh, fire inspectors, we had housing inspectors, we had health inspectors who all went into homes, but only the health inspectors were trained to detect for lead. So. What did we do? We cross-trained all three. What a novel idea. And, and we've really gone after it. And we map, in fact, we had to go back to Annapolis and report to the state of Maryland, since they give us money for lead paint eradication. How did you spend your demolition dollars? How did you spend your rehab dollars? Show us where the open violations were. So we were able to do this whole routine with lead. Here's the open violations that were here when we came to see you last year, state legislature. Uh, here's the map now. The green ones are the ones where we've abated. Here's the yellow triangles representing the ones that are currently active and in court. And, you know, the, the little things like that. Are, we also, we're also attacking, uh, about to attack the things that cause asthma. Uh, kids that, we do look at where our, our kids are, are most at risk. 
and we have sort of a, we have a faith-based initiative called Baltimore Rising that tries to match up those kids that are on everybody's list. Nobody ever shares them. We'd rather have kids die with their confidentiality in place than talk to each other yeah. about how we coordinate services to get to them. So we've taken the kids that are on the, you know, we get schools in there, DSS, health, recreation, uh, police, prosecutors, and we've gotten the churches together and said, hey, let's target these kids. Here's the kids, here's the rec centers, here's the job programs, let's go. So those are some of the things we're doing, but we need to put social services in there too. We borrowed a page from Boston, and Mayor Menina, who's a great mayor, and uh, we put a social worker in every single police precinct, which has helped with some cross-coordination as well. But we need to stat social service. Thank you. This is great. Uh, we've promised to deliver the mayor to a dinner in a few minutes. I want to get everyone in, so if you'll be as quick as you can with your questions, and we'll be uh, brisk with responses. So please. Thank you. I'm Ann Eilbracht. I'm the Director of Human Resources for the City of Minneapolis. And um, like New Welcome. Orleans and like Baltimore, the City of Minneapolis went to New York, looked at ComStat, took it home, called it something different. We call it Code 4. But we've implemented it very successfully. And it is fascinating to watch those meetings. But I think to be legitimate, we have to uh, look at those drops in crime rates and try to determine to what extent the thriving economy has influenced those. If you take credit for all those well, drops in crime, what will happen? I take credit. I take, the NYPD takes credit, and I'll tell you the reason why. <laughs> in 1994, the, the, um, the um, employment rate did not improve that much in 95, yet we had the most historic crime drops that New York City has ever seen. Nothing happens that fast. The other thing is with the historic um, uh, job uh, market, I think it was the lowest since 1957. If that's the fact, then how come the crime rate isn't what it was in 1957? We're looking at Baltimore over the last right. 10 years. You realize that in America right now, although we're still we're patting ourselves on the back how great we're doing with crime, the violent crime in America, murder, rape, robbery, and assault, is three times higher than it was in 1961. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Mm. In 1961, it was 152 per 100,000. Now it's 500 per 100,000. And black children between the ages of 18 and 24 are still being slaughtered in America at 20 times the national rate. The other thing is, is as far as the uh, employment, that only measures 18-year-olds and above. I don't know if you're aware of that also. so. It's not that you know a few people got jobs at McDonald's that stopped people from stealing cars or shooting one another on the street. That can happen over a long-term situation, but nothing else can explain what happened in New York, especially those first few years, than the NYPD. And I've heard all the theories. It's the weather. It was the Big Brother syndrome. They didn't want to see. The, they didn't want to go to jail too. It was going to be the employment rate. It was abortions were up. It was AIDS. We heard everything. All right. So there's nothing new to this. Why can't we just give credit where credit is due? If a new CEO can take over Chrysler, or they can take over General Motors, or any other organization, and they can do much better quarterly, why can't it happen with the police department? Because the dividend that the citizens get back is the 12, 15, or 20 percent crime drop. That's the investment you give. You make the investment, that's what you get back. Just give, it's not so hard. Put the, I, go ahead. I get in here, the, the, I, I'm a liberal Democrat, and I used to believe that you know, poverty and unemployment was what fueled crime. And maybe that's true to some degree. But I really also believe that crime fuels poverty <laughs> and unemployment. You know, the, the economy was doing great throughout the nation. Maryland had more graduates in our, you know, higher institutions of learning. And guess what? We were still dinging bells as the most violent city. We were the most violent city in America, major city in America, in the wealthiest state in America. Uh, but once Norris took over, I mean, you could see folks, when you clear armed robberies, when you clear the gun cases, we had, to, when you clear the homicide rate, I mean, our homicide rate was in the basement, I'm embarrassed to say, for, the, for all the hoopla of the TV show, our once celebrated homicide unit was only clearing about 30% of the 
their cases, and that's with a very loose definition of cleared. So uh, you can see it. When the police are doing a better job, we had, what, four people looking for 50,000 people wanted on warrants. 250 of them were for murder warrants. Lo and behold, what happens when we actually put 57 people on apprehending those that were wanted for murder and, and, and attempted murder and locked them up? Crime rate, rate went down, and I, I attribute that to uh, and primarily the people of the city and the neighbors supporting the police, but certainly the police officers in, in our city, I can tell you, are the driving force behind making this happen, and there's not a doubt in my mind. Hello, Mr. Mayor. My name is Rachel Brown. I'm a senior at the college. Uh, I guess I'm one of the only ones here, apparently. I'm from Baltimore, right outside Baltimore County. All so right. it's really nice to see you here. It was good to see you. It would be better to see you come back and move into the city. I'm a senior, so I'll, <laughs> I'll be down there soon, I'm sure. Um, my question actually pertains to something you touched on briefly earlier, earlier but that has been uh, you know, bothering me for some time and bothering a lot of Baltimoreans or residents, and that's the exodus of business from the city. And I'm wondering if you could speak to what CityStat is doing to fix that, and if it isn't directly addressing it, what steps your administration is taking to address that problem? Yeah, the, you know, we used to pat ourselves on the back by managing our budget every year. If we had a balanced budget, boy, we were doing a good job. But as we balanced our budget, uh, we let quality of life slip real bad. And we lost 17% of our job base over a 10-year period. We lost 12% of our population. Uh, and it, we responded every year by tightening our belt. Oh, we can't afford to have a police department that, you know, where we can actually pay people a salary to attract them. We can't afford to maintain the parks. We can't afford to do a lot of things. So what we've done now is made a big investment in the quality of life. And I'd submit to you that that's the foundation of bringing businesses back. Uh, because of Jack's good work in New Orleans and New York, I think we got a bit of a gimme from the bond rating agencies. They came in and looked at our fiscal health, even with all these challenges facing us, and they actually upgraded our bond rating from A to A+. Plus. I mean, these are Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and I think the reason they did was because they watch all the major cities. They saw that over a three-year period in New Orleans, you know, they were able to reduce violent crime by 46%, and their revenue base went up, not by 1% or 2%, but went up by, by uh, I think 17% over that three-year period. New York, over the last five years, experienced the same thing. They drove it down by, by 41% or 40-something percent, and, uh, and their tax revenues also went up in that same period. And last year was the first time in 10 years Baltimore created more jobs than we lost. We created 8,200 new jobs last year. That's not me saying it or making it up. You know, that's the State Department of Licensing and Regulation. We have a diverse economy. And we're building on that. 75% of our new job growth was in tech-related businesses. So we are the largest recipient of research, federal research dollars in the country in Johns Hopkins. We're looking to build not just on the infotech, but also on biotech. And there's a tremendous amount of potential if we invest in our people, invest in their talents and skills. We'll develop to an already you know, diverse uh, industrial economy and also the tourism sector and hospitality. We're going to add the cutting edge to the new economy and, and that's what we're doing. We'd like to make the term digital harbor synonymous with Silicon Valley. And we have institutions like Coppin and Morgan and Loyola and Hopkins uh, to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Oran Segev. I'm a second year master's student at the Kennedy School. Thank you both for your talk. Uh, my question is about Comstat, uh, specifically for crime. Um, Comstat and CityStat is a, a tool for getting police and city employees to perform their jobs more effectively, the, the way I see it. And my question is, what are the policies or actions that you think are important complements to, the, to CompStat uh, by actually getting the people on the street to change their behavior, not just the people hmm. performing the, the city jobs and getting the people on the street to commit less crimes? Well, what happens in Comstat, as far as the police are concerned, is this. Let's say there's two robbers. In the, in the pre comstat days, the robbers would go out and do 50 robberies. One robber would get caught. Nobody would interview that guy to see who his accomplice was. Meanwhile, that guy's out there robbing another 50 people and runs into a foot cop somewhere, and he gets collared. So those two guys were in jail, but they did 100 robberies. The difference is, with Comstat is, maybe we spot them after they do 10 or 8. 
And as usual, we go out, we try and find them, and usually the first time we stake it out, we come up with like that sneaker or something, you know. Uh, but maybe we catch the first guy after he did 15. We interview them many times, they give up the other guy, we catch that guy after he did another five. So now, instead of doing 100 robberies, they did 20. That, those two go into jail. Into jail. You times that to the 10,000th power, that's how crime goes down. And the message goes out among the criminal element. Believe me, they all talk to one another. They know when the cops are on the move, all right? And what happens is they wind up in jail or they go on, some of them go on to do other crimes that are less violent or some of them start to, stop doing the crimes altogether but they have to know that the police are serious about that. And it's the same way, which we haven't touched on, with police corruption. You map all the police corruption, you look to see where it is, that's where you put your internal affairs, that's where you do the stings, and the police corruption goes all the way down. Just like that, it's the same thing with stop and frisks and all this profiling business. Map everything, see what cops are making those stops, see who's making the arrests, why are they making those stops, have internal affairs there, do um, targeted stings. The NYPD now, there's 1,100 stings a year. They set up apartments, they set up cars with money, with drugs, and um, the, the corruption complaints came down dramatically. So once whoever it is knows that you're looking at them, you know, it goes down. I think also what, what you were saying was how do you change the public's attitude? I mean, because government can't pick up trash as quickly as people throw it down. Mm. And if everybody wants to be committed to selling drugs in a 10 block area, you know, it's a much tougher problem to tackle than if the neighbors in that area have sort of the majority critical mass they need to come out with some courage on their steps and say, hey, you can't do that on my corner. And I think, what, I think the way you change that and the way we're changing it is by, by delivering, by producing. It used to be people would call 911 and, and we had an attitude that there's nothing you can do about drugs until you legalize it, so why bother and why try anyway? And guess what? Police didn't bother and they didn't try anyway. You know, it, uh, that wasn't true across the board, but I mean, that was sort of the attitude being preached. So guess what? Neighbors see them drive by, they don't see them do anything about it. They assume either that they're lazy or that they're corrupt and they stop calling the police. But when they see that they're actually doing something, they call in. Same things are true with all the other things city government does in reducing trash. We had a big publicized case where we actually nailed an illegal dumper. And guess what? We started getting all sorts of information. All the people that had never seen the tag numbers before start calling in the tag numbers. You know, so people have to see their government, and it's their government. I mean, it's not like something that somebody imported. They vote for it, they pay for it. But when they see government doing its side of the equation, they do their side. And they also make decisions like, I'm going to put the new roof on my house instead of moving in with that Aunt Sally in Cockeysville. I'm going to do, you know, they do all those things. And so it, it, it starts to feed on, it starts to build and feed on itself. Mr. Leo. Maurilio Leon, a Kennedy School student. And my question actually, just to dovetail off what you're talking about, is how do you incorporate low income and minority communities? And how do you get them actively involved? You mentioned previously you're using technology as a, as a means to decipher information to the community. Well, many times low income and minority communities don't have access to technology, yet alone computer or any type of, of hookup. How do you get those people actively involved in the civic activities right. for the long, because they've been so marginalized many yeah. times before? In the well, those past. people, you know, poor people have eyes and ears too. Poor people are most, are most likely the victims of of armed robberies and, and homicides and, and shootings and the people that Jack talked about that used to put their kids to bed in a bathtub so they wouldn't get hit by stray gunfire. I mean, are the are the very, you know, are the very places where we're putting our resources. So uh, poor people want to be involved. P poor people care about their neighborhoods as well. My best numbers in our majority African American city, among African Americans anyway, came from the poorest, the most hardest hit precincts in our city, in the in the primary. So I, I think, uh, you know, whatever the, the, the downside of the digital divide, and, and maybe it's true that it's harder to get the emails into as many houses in poor areas, but people certainly see the activity more, and that communicates better than any, in any email or phone call or some newspaper story can. Uh, we communicate by action, and we do it in some of our hardest hit neighborhoods. And, and, and nothing replaces the foot cop, as far as the police are concerned. They have to interact with the community, 
and the precinct commanders must go as, um, I mean, I, I know the NYPD best. Those precinct commanders are at community meetings three or four times a week. You know, they know what the problems are, the doors are open, um, and, that's how they, and that's how they address it. They have civilian patrols, um, they have the auxiliary police program, they have the civilian police academy. So, um, is it perfect? No. But I think what happens is if the community sees that the cops are at least trying, they get more actively involved um, with the police. Thank you. Thank you. Elizabeth Siggins, I'm also a student here at the Kennedy School, and um, I have a longer question that I'm still trying to figure out, so maybe I'll ask you later. But uh, the short one. In the, I will ask the <laughs> short one, which is that in the numbers you presented, you haven't talked about how many arrests were made last year, and I'm wondering how many there were. And well, uh, uh, we had fewer arrests last year than we had in 1999. I mean, there were, I think, didn't we? It was a slightly fewer. I know we looked at it a week before the end of the year, and we were all surprised that it was lower than the year before. Of course. There were, you know, within certain categories, we had some exceptions to that. We arrested a lot more people wanted for murder, attempted murder, or for shooting people or shooting at people time and time again. So we arrest overall, it was, I mean, statistically, it was probably flat. It was either 100 less or 100 more. But we did do a much better job of clearing the most violent cases and putting those people behind bars for a very, very long period of time. Uh, I can tell you a story. In 1995, Mayor Giuliani calls me over to City Hall. We used to go over and see him a couple times a week. So I go over there and I carried my Comstat book over there and we went to his office and below his office is like a little dining area there. And he said to me, you know, I said, you know, we're down about 15% in crime and we're down about 10% in arrests. So um, we're actually doing a better job of closing cases with, with arrests. And he said to me, no, no. When the crime goes down, the arrests have to go up. I said, Mr. Mayor, that's <laughs> not what counts. The only thing that counts is less victims. Whether we do it by prevention, whether we do it by arrests, that's the only number that counts in this book. Do we have less victims. Because we can come up with any kind of a program that you want, sweeps and everything else, but if it's not going to lower the crime, it doesn't mean anything. And you know, for, to, to his credit, from that day on, he never mentioned arrests again. And he said the only thing that counts is having less victims. And what you'll find is that in New York now, I think the crime is down 58% since, um, since uh, 1993. And for those charges, the arrests are down dramatically also. Because you can't solve all the cases. So you're going to still solve that proportion. But if you have less crime, you're going to have less arrests. We've also had fewer, in the last year, we had 5% fewer uh, excessive force complaints. And we had 14% fewer discourtesy complaints, even with adding an additional 100 officers and having much more activity and contact between police and people who are on the street. We also implemented, a, before the state legislature told us to, a, a, we issue tickets, like stop tickets, whether it elevates to an arrest or not, vehicle stop, as well as pedestrian stops, which track the stops by race and uh, to, in order to safeguard against allegations of race, racial profiling. You can't do a good job of this you can't make your city a safer place if you're not willing also to police your own police and be honest about how you manage them. Our final question. Hi, I'm Maonak Benitor. I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm also from Maryland, but from Montgomery County. Ooh, I was from there. <laughs> I escaped in a balloon during the second Reagan administration. <laughs> um, but I was wondering, you touched a little bit about public, about public health, and I know that in late 99 and early 2000, mm -hmm. Baltimore was known as the city with the largest amount of syphilis cases, with 25% of people having syphilis. So I was wondering what you did to combat that. We, we started statting it. We do a thing called health stat. Uh, we, get, we cooperate with the local hospitals. I, I don't have those numbers here. We're in third place. We're not in first anymore. <laughs> Shall I mention the cities that are ahead of us? <laughs> no, we won't, we won't do that. Uh, we, we, uh, we almost brought the gonorrhea map with us, but 
we decided against that. But, <laughs> you know, again, it's the same principles, and we're applying it to public health things. Uh, we have a great health commissioner in Dr. Peter Bielenson, and those numbers are starting to move in the right direction. And if you give that gentleman your address, we can send you, you know, sort of how we track. We can send you the executive summary and show you where we are on all those various diseases. We just had a just had an announcement three weeks ago, and uh, it was a pretty positive. They even did a positive story about it in the Baltimore Sun that they're they're starting to move in the right direction. And again, I, I guess the point we're trying to make on all of this is that human nature is the same. And if you have a big organization of human beings, they all want to do their job well. They really do, uh, but they have to be led. You have to watch what's being done, and you have to define victory. And, and set goals, sometimes very ambitious goals, in order to get the organization to rise to accomplish it. And so, and we're doing that in, in our, our health department across those various diseases too. So, Jay Leno, eat your heart out. Thank you very much. This is. Uh... Thank you. We. Uh... We had hoped to, to have an event to kick off uh, what we're calling uh, City Fair that would generate excitement about working in government and making a difference. And this has uh, gone far beyond even our wildest dreams, uh, as was, I think, measured by the uh, lively, uh, this is one of the liveliest Q&A sessions that uh, we've had in this room in quite some time. So I'd very much, I, I would suggest that, that in the long run, City Stat's going to mean more for Baltimore than even beating the New York Giants in the Super Bowl. I'd like to thank Mayor o O'Malley, and I'd uh, like to thank Mr. Maple for joining us here and for uh, uh, for uh, giving this uh, very good uh, presentation. Thank, Thank you very you. much.